Hi, uh, I'm uh, Samuel Sandoval. I'm a faculty and an extension specialist at the UC Davis. And today uh, I will be talking about uh, uh, my mission and vision for the Robert Hagan Endowed Chair. Uh, thank you for joining. So um, uh, this is what I'm gonna be talking today. I'm gonna be providing a background on the Robert Hagan Endowed Chair. Uh, also about Robert Hagan, uh, what he did. Uh, later, I'm gonna be talking about uh, myself. Sam Sandoval 101, uh, who I am and, and what I've been doing. Uh, the extension program in water management that I've put together, uh, some of the vision and mission for the endowed chair and some opportunities for collaboration. I truly want to, to, to have these discussions with you. Um, so uh, who is Robert Hagen? Actually, I think the best way to explain who is Robert Hagen is actually to let him uh, tell us uh, uh, his background. So, Bob, how about you giving me a quick resume of your background and employment? Okay, Don, here goes. The following standard summary I'm going to give you real quickly. Education, BS 1937 chemistry with honors from the then very prestigious College of Chemistry at Berkeley, MS 41, Soil Physics, Berkeley, PhD 48, Soils Davis. Employment, recruited out of chem classroom at Berkeley to accept in August 1937 a full-time appointment as associate at the Agriculture Experiment Station, Department of Botany. 39, I was in Berkeley Soils Department. Then from 40 to 46, I was called up on active duty to uh, teach ordinance ROTC at Berkeley and serve as administrator of some of the academic programs in that department. Then in 46, served continuously in water departments, which have now become programs in land, air, and water resources. Was chair of then Department of Water Science and Engineering for nine years. Served as associate director of the International Agriculture Programs and also the Drylands Research Institute. Served on committee to organize UC Water Resources Center, established water archives at Berkeley, and then later at UCLA. Retired as Emeritus Professor of Water Science and Extension Water Specialist in 1987, completing 50 years of university service. I've continued for another almost 14 years in active involvement in water. Because of the interdisciplinary nature of my research and teaching, I was active in many organizations and served officers as officers in many. What was it like when you first came to Davis in 1937? Very different, Don. The population of the city of Davis was 1,800, and on campus about five to 600 students, all the two-year farm non-degree program. In this year of 37, the first four-year courses were introduced. Davis is really a small town. As an example, a telephone jack and cord switchboard was located in the storefront on Cheese Street, where the operator could be seen as people walked by. They had just started a campaign then. They said, stop using names, but please use the recently assigned numbers. One morning I forgot and I called for Al Smith. The operator said, please use Al's number. I, he just went to the barber shop, so I suggest you call back in about an hour. <laughs> that was real service. You don't get that today with all these fancy communication devices. I owe much of the So um, that was a very good introduction of uh, Robert Hagan by himself. Um, and actually, um, so that's uh, a little bit of the background of Robert Hagan. And I think uh, uh, something that we share is the good sense of humor. Um, this is the specific description that comes in this endowed chair. So performs applied research to solve problems through science, policy, and management. And then this kind of two-way communications of respond to inquiries from concerned groups and facilitate access to experts to these concerned groups, uh, bring information, information needs to appropriate groups that may lead to research activities for the greater value of the public. Um, so, <clears throat> Now, let me tell you um, who I am. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Sandoval, Sam Sandoval, born and raised in Mexico City, 26 years of my life. Um, then um, 
Well, you know, I have been working. I, I have, I had a job since I was 13 years old. Uh, I started by um, a bagging groceries. I, I used to work at a grocery uh, uh, store and uh, help people when they were uh, paying their groceries and I was putting on putting them on the back. Uh, I just received the tips and that was that was how I started um, working. I before after that I uh, had my own construction firm. I was building houses, uh, doing some structural design. Uh, I work also at a, a soils uh, lab, uh, designing uh, foundations. Um, and a lot of that, but I, I call myself a late bloomer because um, basically uh, the last year of my um, of my major of my bachelor's, that's when I start getting uh, interested about water. After finishing my bachelor's degree in civil engineering, then I get my master's in hydraulics, then a PhD at a, the University of Texas at Austin in environmental and water resource engineering where I did a lot of studies in the Rio Grande that I continue doing. Uh, currently, if you ask me who I am, I'm a water counter. I count water. Uh, I'm a hydrologist, yes. Uh, I know I might be, my specialty will be a water resources management scientist, if such a thing exists. And, and I'm also a psychom, uh, a science communicator, uh, and a team integrator. I really like to, to integrate teams. Um, now, let me explain you what I've been doing in the last 10 years that, uh, since I've uh, joined uh, UC Davis. So uh, you can see how I'm fitting into this and that chair. Uh, on 2011, when I arrived, um, uh, I started talking with uh, people from the Department of Water Resources. And they basically put together this um, uh, census. They send these uh, surveys as a census for uh, different farmers throughout the state of California in terms of what are they growing, what is the irrigation system that they have, what, what crop are they growing, their irrigation system, how many acres, and the source of water, surface water, groundwater, or both. For 20 different crops, for all the crops throughout the state in all these different regions, and all that information when I came here, it was found in an Excel file. It was a huge database that, that it was hidden in there. I decided to put to move that one into a GIS component, and that's that's what you're seeing here. It's one of the first works that I've done, and information I did some information synthesis to put that to respond to that a agency group inquiry to move this into a, um, a, a this kind of maps. And um, later, um, I start. I receive a, an email from some of the agency uh, people of Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency and some of the uh, nursery growers there, that they were worried that they will have to save some water, to conserve some water. Uh, in this particular area, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a groundwater overdraft. For a long time, they've been extracting more water of the ground than what is being replenished, that is being recharged. And that has uh, made very detrimental effects some of, of those are saline intrusion. What you're seeing here is a, a picture when I came, when I was uh, traveling there, where I saw the different irrigation systems and associated with those irrigation systems uh, that they were also a, a very well a watering the, the road. So in that case, I did a, a thorough study of how much water can be saved if they implement conservation, uh, water conservation, they would able to save 5,000 acre feet. And that is of the 12,000 acre feet that they have as an overdraft, it is about a third, it's a little bit more of the third of water. And that is the water that it can be saved um, more easily. Uh, the other one you will require some investment because uh, this agency wanted to save some water. Uh, most of the income of the agency comes from selling water. So if you're telling your consumers that they should not buy you that much water, what that means is that you're not gonna uh, receive the same income as, as you used. Something that happened in this specific basin is that they were looking at increasing the water fees, the water rates. And what does that mean? That they will go at that point, it was $210 per acre foot, the cost of water, of groundwater. And they were thinking increasing it half or double the amount or triple the amount. And specifically for certain growers, the amount, the dollar amount that they pay for water compared to their overall operations budget is very small. 
it's in the order of three to 5% and they have large operations. However, for vegetables, for the lettuce that we eat, um, that is a uh, different. They actually have a, a, about, um, what they spend in water starts from 14%. And if you increase their water rate, it can go all the way to 30, 35%. So those were some of the things, some of the outcomes that I had. Uh, later, I uh, developed more uh, research in that area to estimate what will be the land use, the distribution of the land use to actually try to meet those 12,000 uh, acre feet of, of overdraft to reduce, to fill that gap, to reduce that gap. Um, this is myself, this is in 2012. And yes, there were water meters in California. Um, before Sigma, there were some uh, basins where we have water meters there. And this is myself talking with one of the farmer about how they use water in their farm. Uh, similarly, um, students, students helping me out with this uh, research, Bell and Jenna. Uh, and later with uh, some of these uh, land use analysis, uh, Lau, uh, Laura Lisa Garza also helping me out in here. So after that, I started working in this Hydrology 101 program. And this has been a super fun uh, program that I have. Basically, it's a science communication and program training. By the way, the picture that you're seeing here is the picture of my first uh, extension event in Napa. And I was talking about uh, hydrology and climate change to farm workers in English and Spanish. That was, that was the first event. And this is what this uh, program is about. It's explaining in a 15 minute talk or 30 minute or one hour, depending on how water moves in, in the landscape and what, what can we do to uh, prevent contamination. This was in, in a field day in, in Napa. Later, I start partnering with Lisa, Lisa Blecker. And um, this has been one of the um, uh, events that we put together, yes, in the back of the truck with the model in there. And the two of us uh, uh, working on this field day, training farm workers about the uh, best management practices for uh, using water and pesticides there. Um, another picture with Lisa, Lisa Blecker. Um, and this program has been done all over the all over the state. It's just impressive the amount of uh, presentations that we have done throughout the state. Uh, this ultimately evolved from these uh, field, uh, field days into a program that is called Keep Pesticides Out of Water. And it is a program where Lisa and I, we have learned from the uh, field expertise of each other. And I have learned pesticide management. She has learned hydrology. And we have put these two things together to um, um, being able to do these um, materials, to put together these materials for providing uh, education credits, uh, education hours to PCAs, to pesticides control applicators and to pesticides control uh, advisors. So this is now uh, some materials that are used to train these uh, people to uh, prevent them to uh, contaminate water due to pesticides chemical application, which is the last resource. And that has been with a lightsaber in, in Southern California. This is, we recorded a lot of these videos and now DPR uses many of these videos to provide this uh, academic training to, to the PCAs, to the advisors and applicators. And of course we have had fun with, with Lisa. So that, that has been a part of the, of the a joy of doing this program. After this program and the success of this, I've been also doing it with the 4-H, with the 4-H clubs, where I bring again the model and then I teach students how water moves in the ground. And um, this has been in conjunction also sometimes with the uh, students from, from my class. This has been done and you can actually see them how they, they like to play with the groundwater model. Um, and I have done also this with high schoolers, um, not only in terms of showing them how water works on the, on the ground, but also hiking and providing these outdoor experiences so they can actually live the water cycle. This is a program that I, so far I have a YouTube channel that has reached uh, about 38,000 views. Um, and uh, this is the list of the different uh, videos that are um, most uh, viewed in my channel. Uh, something that I do want to highlight is that 
most of these videos, they are actually in Spanish. There is an important audience for this specific content uh, in Spanish. And, and I can see uh, myself being uh, very capable of providing this information to these specific audiences. Um, from this of all these, uh, you can see what is the distribution. And I have people from all over the world, the States, Mexico, and different countries uh, taking a look at the uh, my uh, YouTube channel. Um, 75% of the people that I've uh, that uh, take a look at my videos, they are 34 years or younger. And half of them, they are 24 years or younger. We are, uh, I'm, I've been able to uh, provide uh, these materials, to create these materials that are seen from younger generations. I'm, and I'm very proud to, to mention this because it is um, something that is uh, really close to my heart to provide this information to, to our younger generations. Ooh, then it came the Russian River. And with the Russian River, well, you know, this was a conversation with David Lewis. We were doing a field trip and a lot of the same problems of a competition of a different water uses, different uh, users for water, environmental, uh, agriculture, cities, water being imported, the um, reservoir reoperation, something that happened in there, it, it is also something that I've um, uh, that I've done back in when I was doing my PhD at Texas. Um, specifically, there is a reservoir in this area that is called Lake Mendocino. And this reservoir, what you can see here is in 2014. Uh, this is the boat ramp. And this is exactly the same boat ramp, but without any water. There was literally no water on that year. This boat ramp that you can see here with the tree, well, the tree doesn't have now any leaves and you can see that far, far away, you actually have to hide to reach water. The reservoir was full. Something interesting about this reservoir is that when it was built in the 1960s, a Congress allocated two thirds of the, of the money to build it. And thinking that the other third of the funds will come in the next legislature, where actually that th other third um, a, a, Funding never came. So this is a dwarf uh, reservoir. It is a reservoir that has built two thirds up and that is missing one third to go up. Um, basically what we evaluate in this specific basin at the beginning was to see if we can, what will be the effects of the current, what is how empty or how full the reservoir can be uh, in the future um, considering current conditions, if we increase the reservoir and if also we decrease the water import that this reservoir um, uh, is subject to. So in this axis, we uh, evaluate different analysis for increasing the reservoir for 15,000 acre feet, Terry, all the way on. Also to reduce the water imports from 100% all the way to 0%. And in this case is the reliability. 100% reliable is that the reservoir will meet the water demands or 90% will be that 90% of the time it will meet those demands and so on. So as you can see, even though you may have a larger reservoir, if uh, the water, the imported water is stopped or is reduced, it will have an, an, an important impact on the water supply reliability. What that means is that even though the reservoir might be grander, it might be empty. Uh, the, this basin depends a lot on the imported water from the Eel River. Um, so that was one of the studies that we put in there. This was used to um, be discussed by different stakeholders. It was submitted a report for the Water, the water Resources Control Board. Um, but this is, this is true. Many of the students that I've been working, uh, Pablo and Maritza, who, who helped me out with this work, and uh, later we've been putting uh, in the South Fork of the Eel River a similar analysis when we're estimating what is the impact of a new um, of water users that want to get a water permit, in this case, cannabis growers. If uh, cannabis growers get um, a water right, what will be the impact to the environment and to other already, uh, to water right holders that already have their, their water right? So that's something that we're working in here. They were putting together this graphical user interface where we are um, showing some of these results. And um, also in the Upper Hill River, we are thinking about decommissioning dams. There is a, 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 an important uh, movement on that part of the basin that uh, getting rid of the dams. 
to put to leave this as a, a hundred percent a free flowing river uh, without any dams. This will have an impact on the ecosystem, but also have an impact of the water that is again exported from the Eel River into the Russian River and the reservoir that we talk. So we have done a lot of interesting work in there. Then, but that time the drought hit really hard California. And that's when I start uh, becoming this kind of information resource. Um, basically what you can see here is that I was given a, interviews, uh, I was talking with different people from the media. Uh, NPR, this is a picture that I was taking when I was interviewed by NPR and my, my knees were shaking. Uh, definitely the same, some of these uh, articles and uh, sharing this information with the Latino Hispanic population. Um, basically, uh, this is the uh, snowpack, this is the um, uh, snow elevation of uh, the Sierra Nevada and the Northern Sierra Nevada in April 1st, 2011. And why in that time? Because basically that's when most of the storms will be already, have already fallen in there. Um, what happening here is that um, this is uh, the first year that when I came to interview, and this is how I see actually the Sierra from, from my plane. And this will be the first year of the drought. And you can compare how much or how less snow was in here. The second year of the drought, the third year of the drought, and this is the fourth year of the drought. Uh, the Sierra Nevada without Nevada. The snowy Sierra without snow. Um, and basically that's that's what you see. This, it only took a 500 year drought to change legislation and that was Sigma. And that's uh, what I see at, at that time. And then providing all these Sigma briefings and communications to a different agencies and interested groups throughout the state. Um, this will be the last year of the drought. And then what you're gonna see is the wettest year on record. There you go. This is the wettest year. And as you can see, it doesn't look as wet as 2011. Uh, something that we are now already experiencing is that the precipitation in California comes mostly in terms of rainfall and not snow. So that's, that's what you're seeing there. Um, then after the wettest year, another drought year, another wet year, another drought year, and this is where we are. We have had only three to four atmospheric rivers this year and we're barely making it. But our odds are to have four or five year atmospheric rivers in a year to be in good shape or to not have only one or two and then being in a drought. California is the uh, weather and as a result, the water and water supplies are very fragile, very variable because of, of climate change. Um, after that, and I, I uh, start working on the implementation of Sigma. And specifically here in Ukiah Valley, I put together, uh, we put together a, a, a water diagnostics. We estimate the water budget for that specific area. And what we did is basically not only estimating the water supplies, but who was using water. And you might be surprised. There are not that many good records for, or for us to actually go and a, a precisely estimate how much water was used in there. But nonetheless, we estimate how much water was used by agriculture and municipal from surface and groundwater. And what were the different groups? One, one of the key um, outcomes of this study is that people that were using their water, they uh, decided to be part of this uh, sustainable groundwater agency, groundwater sustainable agency, the GSA, um, to manage their groundwater resources, but also they were uh, invited and included a, a, a people from the agricultural sector. So they, they have a seat and also from a tribal seat for our native communities. That was very important. This is not actually that common in California. Uh, um, that's very unfortunate, but in this case, we were able to also bring these this, uh, disadvantaged communities or communities that will be highly impacted by groundwater management into the decision-making table, which I think it was, it was very important. Out of this, we published a paper where uh, Maritza won a, a, an award from the University Council of Water Resources. Um, then we did a, a lot of work related with environmental flows. The first thing that we did is estimate the uh, natural stream flow classification. What is the natural fingerprint of rivers in California? How they flow? 
And what we found is that overall, there are three main fingerprints. Um, snow melt, and they have, snow melt has this signature of very low flow during the dry season. Then as snow is melting, we're gonna have the, uh, this rising limb and then this recession as the snow is, um, is almost uh, done, it's almost completely melt. And that will be these areas on the Modoc Plateau and the High Sierras. That's where we have these snow melt driven uh, rivers. Then we have also these uh, winter storm uh, driven rivers where you can see they have higher variability because of the rain and the runoff response. Throughout all these areas in California, this blue, when, when, you have, when these two have a baby, then it will be the snow and rain signature. And th those are all these green uh, rivers that you're seeing around it. And make no mistake, we choose these colors because when you actually mix a yellow and blue, you are gonna get a green color. And that's, that's how we, we decided to, to color these ones. Um, <clears throat> all this information now is available in a, uh, in a website, iflos.ucdavis.edu. And that basically we can provide all this information of all these different 223 uh, sites that we, that we use to estimate this classification. Uh, we put together that information this wasn't done alone. This was done with Belize and Helen and other colleagues uh, working on this. Um, and later with Noel, who also put together the functional flows curve, a uh, functional flows calculator and, and, and so on. So this has been definitely a, a joint project, project. This will be the second map that I will put for, for California. Later, uh, we start also thinking about how is the form of channels, how a channel look like. In, in the state of California. And basically uh, we decided to do a geomorphic classification and, and this is, uh, channels have been classified before and rivers have, their channel types have been classified before. But in this case, we decided to do a tailor-made classification for the state of California. And we decided to start by doing it in the Sacramento Basin. We went and did a lot of field work, a boat lot of field work, and we were able to estimate all these different channel types and how they are different throughout the state. And some of them, they might be uniform, bed undulating, step pool can cascade, a refill pool and so on. Later we decided to, or we uh, received funds to do it for the entire state. We went through all different parts in the state to actually estimate what were, what will be the channel types in these specific regions. Uh, I'm happy to report that we have 10 classes in California and we have been already able to predict it. And um, this has been a huge amount of work. Um, I, this will be the third map that I've been able to put together and that have been done, I mean, again, in, with doing a huge uh, field campaign, not only by us, by, by other uh, institutions helping us out to put this, this crazy idea together. And also recognizing, for instance, here's some other um, decision maker, Belize, uh, Herbe, Colin, Greg, that have been instrumental in developing all these, these, um, uh, these uh, classifications. And here again with Colin and Herbe and everyone else, just uh, making sure that whatever we're predicting that a channel is, it is there. And just to give you an idea, um, if, if think of your favorite a river, but actually see the picture of that. Um, we might be able to tell you how much water in that river is needed to support the environment there and how the channel form, how they, the river look like. This is, this is impressive. Um, as if that wasn't enough, then later we analyzed 800 and more than 800, 810 uh, stream flow gauges that we know that are impaired, that have some certain type of alteration. And we decided to classify them by their type of land use alteration. In this case, some stream flows are, have been altered because of the urban uh, land use. And you can see where they are. Some of them are, have been uh, altered because of agriculture production. Some of them because of reservoirs and some of them because of logging and land use change. And finally, mixed alteration. We've been able to do similarly, classify them, and then later predict it throughout the state. And this has been a huge work that, uh, I mean, it's, it is part of a team. It has been done by also Daisy and Herbe Guillon that, that we've been able to put uh, this, this information um, together. So 
Uh, last but not least, we've been uh, working in some guidelines for environmental flows. So we will be able to uh, provide recommendations on how much water is needed of every uh, reach of every river in California. Every 200 meters, you might be able to point out and say that, hey, for this specific reach, there is this much amount of water needed to protect the environment. And these are some guidelines and that shows how to use all these different data sets that we have been developing. And as of we're speaking, this we're, we're putting it uh, out there for, for, for them. Um, yeah, this the, there is a database where you can actually access this information. And there is a group of people that we are actually looking at this where, where we are uh, sharing all this information, knowledge and um, databases among different institutions, the Department of Water Resources, the State Water Boards, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, other uh, required institutions, NGOs and so on. We've been working towards, towards that end. If this wasn't enough, then we've also done some projects in watching the grass grow, <laughs> cover crops. And literally we've been watching the grass grow. Um, we've been uh, doing research related with winter cover crops and how these winter cover crops, um, how these covering the, so during the non-growing season, the uh, non-cash crop season, so in winter in California, rather than leaving the uh, soils uh, fallow, you can plant some intentionally, you can plant some vegetation in this case is called cover crop to um, generate some uh, soil health benefits. Uh, but in our case, what we were interested in is are these practices economically feasible and are they detrimental to water use for this specific area? So compared to the control is this planting this, this um, uh, vegetation Will it use more water, less water, or it will be the same? For the financial part, we find out for the processing tomatoes that it takes a lot of time to actually the practice for being economically feasible. Furthermore, that not only takes 10 years, but very few times, actually it will, it will be economically feasible. This is the opposite with uh, almond orchards. Similarly, it may take from 10 to 15 years for this practice to be economically feasible, uh, however, um, uh, it is most of the times if you uh, continue doing this practice more than 20 years, most of uh, it, it will, the benefits, the economic benefits for having a cover crop will outweigh the, uh, the cost for it. Um, we went to all these different fields and we have monitored all these different uh, places for cover crops. And we have evaluated if they use more water or less water than their, their, their fallow counterpart. This will be the soil moisture for winter cover crops. And this will be for control. I think at this point is that, so in some places the control or the fallow fields will use more water than the winter cover crops. And why is that? Because there is more evaporation and it is also more runoff out of these uh, fields. Cover crops may retain more, uh, they use more water, but they may retain that water infiltrated and keep that soil moist. That will be for processing tomatoes. And these are the same comparisons for um, almond orchards with cover crops and with native vegetation with grass. And sometimes actually there are very few, there are a few times where actually cover crops use more water or the soil moisture will be less in a cover crop than in, than in the fields. So anyway, um, again, Alisa uh, instrumenting this, uh, the two of us going to Russell Ranch and instrumenting this. Um, later on a field trip with uh, Helene and Daniele there um, and all the different places where we've been doing it. Then it came another science communication project, the Water Talk podcast. That has been super fun. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to, to, to tell you that I've, I've been honored to work with my two co-hosts, uh, Malik and Faith, and <clears throat> that we've been putting this, uh, making all these experts available throughout, through this uh, specific uh, resource, a podcast for everyone. That has been a great, uh, great resource. Uh, so far we have 400 and uh, 4,600 downloads. Um, 
our first season ended last year, 12 episodes. You can, we have our webpage. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can listen to us. It is a super fun project that we've, we've been uh, able to do it. And season two are coming. So that's, that's something that, that we're really looking forward. Uh, the family is growing. We have now two interns that they are helping us out to um, um, uh, help us with the post-processing and editing. So <clears throat> as you have seen, something that I realize is uh, systems are connected. And when I say that is not only the water sources, that it can be all these lists of water sources and all these lists of water users. but also, uh, what I've been trying to do is not only try to match it, so to actually try to make an impact on, on, on these water systems. How? Through stakeholder engagement, through helping them develop a management plus, to provide them or help them write or review guidance documents, through communication plan campaigns, through policy briefings. That has been a lot of work that, that we have developed there. So not only systems are connected, but also the challenges and the solutions. The status of the system is that we have a very a, a, a lot of infrastructure that is uh, aging, uh, outdated operations. We have water scarcity, high variability. In terms of challenges, we have always the two sides of the coins, either drought or floods, fires or landslides. We have climate change. We have a uh, water reliability or water insecurity, environmental degradation, uh, social and environmental injustices. What I can see here is that there is no single solution. Uh, uh, those times when we had the, uh, that uh, silver bullet where we can solve the problems, those are gone. Now we need silver solutions and many solutions. Uh, some of those are related with improved storage management, reduction in water demand, uh, environmental restoration and conservation, incentives and regulations, social and environmental justice, simply justice. Um, I can tell you that in the seventh or sixth economy of the world, California, depending on which year we in which year we are, um, we have people that actually do not have access to clean and affordable water. More than a million in California. Yes, in the largest economy of the states and in the sixth to seventh economy in the world, yes, we have problems of clean and affordable water for some of our communities. So uh, that's also some of the things that we, we are working towards. I have found that these solutions and these challenges, how to start addressing them through institutional capacities. And what you can see here is all the different internal A&R capacities that we have. Cooperative Extension Research and Extension Centers, IPM, California Naturalist, the Center for um, the Institute for Water Resources, the California Institute for Water Resources, 4-H growers, and so on. I have used all those capacities and also the capacities with our uh, sister institutions, uh, Merced, Berkeley, Riverside, Santa Cruz, and use those two also to being able to connect them with USDA, the Army Corps, uh, DWR, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board, DPR, uh, USGS. The reality is that these are only logos. What I've been actually working is with a lot of people, like a lot of people, and trying to put together all these people so we can actually address uh, the solutions to start tackling some solutions and address challenges for water in California. And I've, I have had a lot of fun working with all of you guys. Um, as you can see uh, in here, a lot of this work that you're seeing here, it couldn't have been done without the water management lab. And I decided uh, on purpose not to have, have it named with my last name and to have it named as a water management lab, because yes, this is a, a, a research lab that I will be the person that will be passed through most of the time. I'll be the senior person on the, on the group, but this is a place where all of us as a group of people, we come together and as individuals with our individual interests and strengths to come together and discuss the uh, challenges, solutions of water management uh, throughout California and throughout the world. Um, I'm, I'm super clear that people do not work for me. People work with me. I collaborate with people. I don't work for people and people don't work for me. Um, and that is important because that has provided the, the the environment to actually foster all these very nice ideas that you have seen 
all the way here in, in, this, in this column bar. Um, yeah, it looks like that. This is the water management lab. This is some of us uh, on our lab retreat. Uh, this is during picnic day. Um, yeah, this is our porch uh, lunches. We sometimes prepare a lot of food and we share food in there. Um, yeah, we, we do our typically uh, lunches at least back in the day once, once a month. And we can uh, cook from uh, dumplings all the way to uh, quesadillas. Um, we celebrate together. This is uh, uh, some of the lab retreats that we have done and our transportations and some of the recent lab members and the quinceañera picture where I'm seated in here and all the students are surrounding. Um, and some of these uh, parties meetings uh, uh, in the uh, backyard of our house. <clears throat> and yes, also protesting and, and making our voice uh, sound. And most recently uh, also providing some art activities at a, at a distance where we're sharing art uh, among ourselves. So, ooh, what is next? So what is next you, you may have guessed right. Uh, it is the endowed chair. And in terms of the endowed chair, this is what, it, what is coming. Uh, I would like to, to provide this uh, feedback to, of what Bob Hagan thought about this, uh, this endowed chair. Bob, how can UCD improve its ability to meet these challenges? Well, Don, in my opinion, water studies at UCD, which properly include contributions from many disciplines, are not well coordinated. Some opportunities for interdisciplinary teamwork are not being implemented. The general public and agency personnel, especially opinion shapers and decision makers, are not adequately aware of what UCD is doing, what UC is doing. They find it hard to contact a focal person who can feel their inquiries, help make appropriate contacts with the scientists involved, and then direct pertinent information to them. An exciting proposal to address the needs I've been describing above is now being discussed by university administrators and representatives of the water industry, seeking to create a high level position to provide the needed focal point. As to the future. So uh, these are actually the point where you're, uh, where you can see Robert Hagan actually outlining uh, what he envisioned as this endowed chair, which is a person, a focal person that will be able to look into this uh, water policy or all the needs of the society and different agencies and different um, interested groups of a science and then how they can have in a focal point to actually later turn around and see who is a, a who within the UC system can help to solve or to address those specific needs. And that's that's what Robert Higgins is, is mentioning in there and, and also the need for continued applied research to solve water problems. This is basically what, what Robert Hagan did. And, and you can see that in terms, just reiterating what I started saying, um, perform applied research to solve water problems. You can see that I've done it throughout, throughout the time. Uh, respond inquiries from concerned groups. And I have done it from uh, DWR and Pajaro Valley and the water boards all the way to the Eel River and cover crops. Um, facilitate access to information and experts. Well, you can see it uh, in the different hydrology 101 during the drought, during the wet years. Now with the Water Thought podcast, how we've been able, I've been able to team with other ones and facilitate access to information and experts. Um, bring information needs to appropriate groups. And in this case, uh, through Sigma and through other uh, groundwater management initiatives, uh, being able to... Um, those needs bring it to the university so it can generate more research activities that later will come back into the into the society. Now, how am I planning to put this in that chair? And this is this is something very different. It's, it's different from the, the current uh, vision. 
And what I'm seeing is that I, my vision for the endowed chair is to empower all of you, to empower experts to address water challenges and leverage water outreach programs. Um, yes, this is, this is kind of divided in two. I would like to empower you to address challenges and whatever programs you're already working them, I would like to leverage those programs. How am I planning to do that? It, it is super simple. Uh, I would like to contribute my time of this endowed chair to for the greater good of the LAWR, CAES, and UCA in our community. And I would like to lead by serving. There is there is no other way of leadership than serving. And in this case, I will do it to serve the greater water community. So, um, how is this going to to play out? Uh, in terms of these empowering experts, I would like to develop uh, to showcase the applied research that LA, LAWR extension specialists are doing. And every two years we're going to come together and this is not only a, a, a tailored for specialists but faculty and other students that they are doing this great work, great research work to be able to have always a date uh, and a time where a time and a place where we are going to come together and put together a lot of those a great a projects that we're doing and at the same time make sure that a personnel and agencies from different parts of the state that they are able to come and then do the cross-pollination so that's something that i'm i'm planning to do every two years uh, provide these uh, regular meetings um also uh, empowering experts through seed funds for extension events and again this will be not only for um, people within uh, Davis, but also for advisors. And that's where I see the water program team to be a good partner uh, throughout the state and outside of the UC through the California Institute of Water Resources. And how can we leverage funds for those? Um, not only for extension events, but also for trainings. How can we help our uh, own to, to actually get trained and, and, and continue being ahead of the curve for the different challenges that we have? One thing is empowering experts, but we cannot empower experts if they are not being made. And I think we need to foster the upcoming experts. Uh, and how is that? What you're seeing here is, is one of the pictures that we have in our lab retreats. And this is how we are uh, fostering uh, upcoming experts. There is no other way. We, we have to, to uh, make sure that we are bring together as a group that we are learning from each other that we are training each other, not only in terms of scientific things, professional, personal, how can we uh, get, how can we develop um, a well-rounded person, a, a, a person that will be doing some good for the society. We need to foster our upcoming experts. Now, this is one part of, of my vision. The next part is actually to leverage water outreach programs. And how to do that? Well, we're gonna be doing that through uh, what we already have, I've committed already some funds to the Water Talk podcast. It has been a, a very good uh, a venue to reach in larger audiences. With the California Naturalist and Water Wizards, I'm just extending the, the hand. Can we do these programs not only in English, but in Spanish? These are highly uh, high impact programs that I think may have greater impact in Spanish. We have a market there. I think that's, that's where I want to go. For IPM and keep pesticides out of water, I mean, this is with Lisa. We have, with Lisa, we have been always in the forefront of, of developing materials. Can we develop an app? Can we have developed something that will be in the hands of the uh, advisors and uh, applicators when they need to, when they need it? This is uh, something that is different from, from what has been done, which is um, how can we, uh, uh, I, I, I have a lot of uh, fun uh, working with you guys. What I'm thinking is that these funds will be developed to uh, continue doing that, that work, to leverage some of the work that you're doing and that we are doing together to have a greater impact. That's, that's, that's what I'm seeing. And this is, this is a more collaborative uh, vision for this, for this endowed chair. So what is next? Um, that is... That is, that is a good question. Let me go back here to our friend, Robert Hagen. Uh, 
I see the future. I earnestly hope that both Davis and statewide our leaders, bolstered by encouragement from other organizations, by greater public understanding and with political support, will continue to expand UCD involvement in so many things critical to the future needs of society. Hopefully they will also not be deterred by the short-sighted interests which seek to end or curtail UC studies with great future impact, including genome studies, stem cell research, genetic engineering of plants and animals, and many others. I am pleased that as the UCD campus grows in stature, agriculture, other sciences, engineering, medicine, law, business management, art, and now the environmental school being studied, will continue to develop. The future of UCD is bright. Let's respond fully and promptly to these great challenges and opportunities. Nice. This was uh, super interesting to uh, listen to this uh, uh, video because basically, I mean, in parallel, I was thinking about the same, what's next, a bright future. And, and I can see a, a bright future ahead of us um, because of the people and the community, the people that I work and the community that I have built, that we have built together. Uh, I can see a bright future where uh, we are working across disciplines, um, also including diversity as part of our uh, research activities. Uh, I can see a bright future because my vision is shared um, with others and it's not only shared by embraced by my colleagues, the students and group that I work with. Um, why I can see a bright future um, because when I see all of you, all my colleagues, um, uh, I realized that a, a positive change is possible. Uh, you have shown me that that we can change, that a change, positive changes are, are possible. We are making a positive impact in California, um, in the California society by our, by our, by our individual actions. Uh, guys, uh, I can't wait to continue collaborating with all of you and, and what better way of doing it that that through this endowed chair? And um, so with that, I I would like to thank uh, everyone that came. Um, I do think that um, this shows truly the support that 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 we have as a community put together. That I have been honored to receive with with many of you. Um, super glad to see uh, my dad uh, giving some some. A words to a, some of my colleagues, a, Luis Jackson, Graham Fogg, Daniele, Majdi, Malika, a, Cosana, a, Doc Parker, a, Luis Jackson. A, we have many, many, many people, Carlos Puente, a, all the water management lab folks, Noel, Lerve, a, Grace, and everyone else there, Ramon. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's it's been a pleasure working with you, and I just cannot I can see that we will be able to continue doing this uh, together, and and that's rather than than having this as a way of uh, differentiate or creating a greater um, distance between people that have an endowed chair and people that do not. I want to redistribute these resources. So they are available for the greater community and we can grow together as a community. Thank you, everyone. Thanks and um, thank you for listening.